Good morning, brothers and sisters, as we return to our study in the book of Numbers. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his blessing and guidance, so that we may more clearly understand that which Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, there are many things in this world that are confusing, but we know that truth comes from you. Help us now, Father, that we may listen to that which you would have us to hear. Direct us today in the path where we should be walking. Guide us in that that we should be studying. We ask for your spirit, for your Holy Spirit to be with us and for your angels to attend us. Help us each one so that this study may help us to grow in the knowledge of that which you would need us to understand before we are made ready to give the message that you would have us to give to this world. I thank you for each one that is here. I praise you, Father, for the many blessings and the opportunities that we've had to learn of you. May we make the most of these opportunities with your guidance, with your direction, with your spirit. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now. The question that was asked yesterday, where can we find a study that Elder Jeff had done on Balaam. Now, I didn't have, I did not obtain one of the drives that they offered before they shut down Future for America. However, using the same way of searching a database as we would use in the Ellen White databases, placing the name Jeff Pippinger in quotation marks, placing the name Balaam in quotation marks on YouTube, revealed that he gave a presentation on the 31st of July of 2015. There is a second presentation that was on another YouTube channel, but that channel has been taken down. Now, what is before you right now on the screen is part of what Elder Jeff was presenting on that Sabbath of the 31st of January of 2015 at the Lambert Community Fellowship. Now, is there any question to what I've just said? Well, I did the same thing and I, I didn't find it, but maybe I didn't look long enough. You put Jeff Pippinger in quotes? Yep. I will try to download that presentation. I have it up on two of my computers right now. I put Jeff Pippinger in quotations plus in quotations, Balaam. Okay, I got a January 31st, 2015. That's what I said. Oh, okay. I 31st January, 2015. Okay, yeah, I thought you said July. Okay. I might have, but okay. I thought I corrected myself. Okay. Okay, so this one I hadn't found. It's there now. Okay, thanks. Okay, now. I was led to go through this last night during the evening worship. There's quite a bit of information here. There's quite a bit that Elder Jeff addresses 
on a large number of topics, but he gives good references back to this with numbers 22 to 24. Now, he is linking numbers 22 to 24 with Revelation 9, with the seven thunders, with Luke 1, with 1 Samuel 25, and with Genesis 41. Genesis 41, of course, is the story of Joseph when he is brought out of prison. 1 Samuel 25 is David, Nabal, and Abigail. Luke 1 is the birth of John the Baptist or the pregnancy of Elizabeth with John the Baptist and this with Mary and her visit. Revelation 9, I think we're all very familiar with. And then we have this with Numbers 22 to 24. Jeff, on the chart in the presentation that he was making, and I did my best to read what was on this. The camera work was okay, but was not fantastic. He is showing the ass turned out of the way after 9-11-2001. And that there are two invitations and an ass that does not speak. And that this is occurring prior to the midnight cry. Now, he places this in line with portions of Revelation 9. Of the sealing time with the torment for five months. The first woe begins, the sixth trumpet begins, and then the second woe begins, all before the midnight cry. He compares the ass unable to speak with John's father, Zechariah, being in, unable to speak. He compares Elizabeth's hiding for five months with the torment of the five months in Revelation 9. So my question in the study in which we are involved with right now, should we equate the midnight cry with July 18th? Well, which line are you talking about? I'm asking in any manner. We can apply the line. I mean, help me understand that one. Okay, so we make November 9th, midnight. Okay. And 9-11, the midnight, or not 9-11, uh, July 18th, the midnight cry. Okay. And December 25th, the Sunday law, Twenty. 21. Now, is that in the line for the movement or is that in the line for the world? Well, it's definitely not in the line for the world. So that would be a zoom in onto one of the waymarks. And the question is, which waymark is it a zoom on, zoom in on, right? Because that's what we understand about the lines is that we, each of the waymarks, we can zoom in onto it and we can see, um, information and my view is that it's a zoom on to 9-11 that this movement is about the children of 9-11 up until that point right so 9-11 is because uh, it serves two purposes right it serves mm -hmm. april april 19th 1844 right the arrival of the second angel's message and it also serves the purpose of, of being a parallel to August 11th, 1840. And so when I say 9-11, um, I'm talking about the Islam part of 9-11, August 11th, 1840. 
no. But, but it does transition to the second part as well. No. There's, there's a transition in this movement from the first disappointment, um, the arrival of the, the second angel's message, or I should say from August 11th, 1844, from that, uh, August 11th, 1842, April 19th, 1844. And this was made clear when we looked at Samuel Snow's letters, because this was an issue that Jeff and I had back in 2018 that we were struggling with. Well, one of the things that I observed in that uh, presentation that I found from Lambert Community Fellowship. Mm -hmm. In 2015, Jeff was focused primarily on Josiah Lich. He doesn't bring up anything regarding Samuel Snow. We understand very clearly the need that we have to place Samuel Snow's letters in line with what we're seeing and what we're currently experiencing. But in 2015, Elder Jeff was not doing that. No, because we didn't even really know about Samuel Snow's letters. That's two years later, actually, almost two almost and a half three. years later. Right. Now, <clears throat> as Elder Jeff had written on his chart, between September 11, 2001 and the midnight cry, the ass is turned out of the way. The ass is turned out into the field. And that there had been two invitations from Moabite and Midianite princes. Yet there was nothing that was offered in this study regarding Balaam's two servants that went with him. What symbols can we make of Balaam's two servants? Well, it definitely can symbolize uh, the midnight cry. Okay, I'm looking at something differently. Okay. Balaam was a prophet. He was a good man, but by this point, he is not, correct? Yeah, because he has to have been some kind of prophet of God. I mean, God actually talks to him. He knows about God. Um, so he, he's definitely a, a prophet of sorts, but he also becomes a sorcerer in his connection with Balak. So he's, he becomes a false prophet. He falls away. Elder Jeff is very, was very clear at this point because he was, viewing, he was viewing Balaam as a symbol of the United States. Mm -hmm. As we understand, symbols can have more than one interpretation. They can have more than one meaning. But it's pretty clear that that in the context in which Jeff is presenting it, Balaam does represent the U.S. I'm not, I'm not arguing against that. Where was Balaam living at this time? He, he was by the Euphrates or near the... Could the point be made that he was living in the area of Babylon. Yeah. So you wouldn't have a problem with that presentation. No, nope, that would be correct. So we have a false prophet that comes out of Babylon to come to the Moabites and the Midianites. You have two servants of a false prophet that come with him.
what are the two major tenants that are presented most frequently by the Pope and his minions as being basis for their faith in the Catholic Church? Well, there'd be Sunday and the Trinity. Okay. What about the immortality of the soul? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the immortality of the soul and Sunday. Yeah, okay. They okay. they do they all do also state the Trinity is something that they that I agree. the other people to to Catholicism. Um and, and I've never actually seen them argue that immortality of the soul is something that ties people to Catholicism. Okay. Um, but I have seen Sunday and of course um, the Trinity. But we know the two great errors are Sunday sacredness and the immortality of the soul. Right. Now just another point here. What about if what if um, they represented the two servants represented church and state? the two okay. of the United States. That would be another possibility. Is there is there a manner that there is an antithesis to republicanism and Protestantism? I don't know how to get an antithesis. Well, I mean the the opposite. <clears throat> the Pope hates both. Come again, please. The Pope, well, let's say the whole whole Catholic system. If you go into it, they hate freedom of conscience. They hate freedom. Period. We're supposed to be like every Catholic is supposed to be more of a citizen of Catholicism of the Roman Catholic Church than their country. I just don't know what the opposite of Protestantism is or the opposite of Republicanism. Well, isn't the opposite is of, of Protestant people. isn't the opposite of Protestantism Catholicism? Because the Protestants are protesting Rome. Yeah, well, in that sense, but but I mean that's just the what they're protesting. So um, and then the opposite of republicanism would be communism, socialism, socialism. I don't know. I just don't know if you can have an opposite of republicanism. Okay. I mean, it's just a, a different one of the different types of forms of government. There's lots of different types of forms. Um, I mean, obviously it. It recognizes the, the God-given right of the individual um, to be sovereign, to not to be able to have free speech and, and to associate with whoever he wishes and to um, to act in whatever they consider their, their own best interest. Um, there's lots of forms of government that are opposed to all of those principles that are quite different from each other. Okay. Now, Elder Jeff had also joined a ceiling time with the ass being turned out of the way. We have these two invitations from Moabites and the Midianites. The second invitation is from those that are more honorable than the first. At the first, Balaam is told directly, you are not to go, you are not to curse this people. 
At the second, he bids those making the invitation to tarry with him that night that he would give an answer in the morning. They, however, divined correctly that Balaam likely would not go because if he's a true prophet and God has said, no, you're not to go the first time, why would God change the second time? But Balaam was greedy. When he got up that next morning and those people making the invitation had left, he became anxious because he wanted the bribe. Now, Elder Jeff brought this in line between the midnight cry and the Sunday law. We have the ass now no longer turned out of the way. They are now coming between vineyards. And the vineyards have walls of protection. But where are these vineyards? Where was the field that the ass was turned out into? Was the field likely on the way from Babylon? Would we have said that the field was in Palestine? Now, the point that I'm looking at here with this, with the ass, with the double walls, we know that the wine, the vineyards, are an area that it's said in the Bible many times that the vineyards, the harvest here is the harvest of the earth. that we are to go into this vineyard on behalf of the Lord. But is this what Balaam is told to do? Is he to go into the vineyard? He is on the road. He is between two walls. The vineyards are on the other side of the walls. Could we make the application that these vineyards also were on the way to Palestine, on the way to Balak? Yeah, I'm just having, okay, so let's take a look at this chart that Jeff has. So, I mean, I was looking at the video. I can't get, it doesn't have a transcript, um, but I'm looking at the screen here of what he has. So, so the idea is that he's taking, because this is before we understood the symbol of midnight. Right. Right, so we just had the midnight cry, so we don't have midnight in there. Um, and so he's going to have the time at the end, 1989. And he's going to line that up with, um, well, he says here, the fifth trumpet begins. Star falls, fifth trumpet begins. But then he's going to have, um, in the, then he, well, you can't see it on yours here, but on his, he's going to have 9-11 that, that the five months happen, right? So... He's going to put 150 years there, and then he's going to put four years, six months or something in there. And I think this is probably dealing with uh, um, the fall of, Con uh, the, of um, uh, Constantinople. 
right? Very likely. Yeah, and then and then he's going to have that sort of divided uh, with the 391 years and 15 days, and then he's going to have the four, uh, the number four there again at the end of that. So this is sort of the binding off idea that's been introduced at that time. So I don't see it consistency in what what he's doing that is later on we sort a lot of this out um but you know because he doesn't have midnight in there and where he's placing these different events it doesn't really seem to fit um so he's so he's going to have the the fifth trumpet come 1989 and then he's going to have the woe, the first woe begin and and the question is what does the key turn to mean angela's asking um so you're going to have this 150 years and that's going to be from 9 11 to the midnight cry but you know this is just kind of mixing up different lines and they don't really fit together because we know 9 11 is going to be august 11th 1840 if we're going to connect it to islam now he's then going to, of course, use this again to have a repeat, in a sense, not literally time-wise, but just symbolically, of the second and third woe, beginning with, uh, or the first and second woe, pardon me, the, with the third woe arriving at 9-11. Um, I mean, I, I haven't watched the study, but... Uh, this this doesn't really make any sense to me what he's doing in the sense of taking that 150 years of five months and these binding offs and putting it there especially in light of what we understand now about josiah lich's prophecy and samuel snow's letters and ezekiel that what jeff's doing here in 2015 is he starting down a path where we're going to start to try to connect um, Islam with our history and and specifically you know this prophecy of Balaam and and other things as well so it's not just about the prophecy of Balaam even though the study is entitled Balaam but I don't I don't think that would be consistent with what we understood in two thousand in 2020 so five years later I don't think Jeff could have looked at this study and said, here is how we understand what's happening. When we were talking about this yesterday, the goal was to find a mm -hmm. study that Elder Jeff had done regarding Balaam. Right. I agree. There's a lot of things on this chart and in this study that were presented in 2015 that have had major refinements mm -hmm. by 2020. Right. And so, so because you had asked the thing of what about the turning away being 1993, right? I did, yes. And, and that would actually make more sense depending on, on how we're looking at this. But if we were to... to take 9-11 as the crushing. Now, he's going to deal with the crushing because Stephen talked about this before the study. So, Stephen, you had uh, that Jeff has 9-11 <coughs> being um, the turning away from the field, or the turning into the field, away from, from the path. How did you put that, Stephen, that, that you understood that Jeff taught? Or Stephen's not even there. I don't see him. Okay, well, he can't help us then. Anybody remember what Stephen said exactly? I don't. Okay, so so there was this turning away into the field that he's going to place at 9-11, and then the economic strife that followed would be this crippling of the United States, because Balaam is going to represent the United States. And so when his foot is crushed, that's the economic uh ramifications of what happened after 9-11. So, but at least that's the way I understood it, that this is post 9-11 and that it's it's the ramifications and maybe something else that happens 
uh, in connection with Islam, some other event. And, and that's why when we had July 18th and we tied Islam to it, definitely an attack against the United States, a nuclear attack, would fulfill that. Yeah, so the foot crushing is after 9-11. Exactly. That's, that's what Stephen said. So 9-11 is the turning away into the field. And that uh, was Iran that said that. Yeah, I know. That was Iran that said that. But I'm just saying that that's what was understood. Okay. So Iran's saying that, um, that that's what he understood. And then the Sunday law would be the ass speaking. Right? So we can see that here. Now, Jeff puts up here the double wall, right? So, so he understands there's some significance in this double wall. Um, now, even though he writes these things after the, the lines, he, he's really putting them on the lines. Like the ass turns out of the way at 9-11, not between 9-11 and the midnight cry. It happens at 9-11. The double wall is the midnight cry, and then the ass speaking is the Sunday law. Um, but there's other ways that we could look at it. I mean, we could look at the turning out of the way of being 1993, the crushing is 9-11, and then the Sunday law still would be the ass speaking. But one of the things about this, so, so we have Balaam represents the United States. Now, why is he riding on an ass, right? And the other thing is the two servants. That's what we're trying to examine. Right. So the ass is Islam, but the United States isn't in control of Islam. No. But Islam is hindering the United States, right? Correct. Because that, that's the way I understand it. So... So you have you have Islam, which is this ass, and, and this is the, the vehicle upon which Balaam chooses to travel. But it's going to represent what happens with Islam in connection with the United States. Now, I mean, the history of the United States and Islam goes back fairly far. I mean, we obviously have these modern things after 1989. Definitely 1993 is a significant event especially as it foreshadows 9-11. And I've always taken it as a foreshadowing, uh, not, not actually a waymark. And then we would look at the, the Sunday law, the ass speaking. Why? Now, we know it's the United States that speaks with its legislation. So why would the ass be speaking to the United States at the Sunday law? is another question I would have. You know, how how Jeff looks at that. Okay, so <clears throat> in this situation, in the way that we have been, we've studied in the past, mm -hmm. when we look at 1989 being the time of the end, The number of years between the United States first coming to an understanding about Islam and 1989. If I remember my history right, we would be looking at a total of 184 years. Would that then be a symbol for 1840? Possibly. So you're going back to um, the battles that we had talked about there um, in 1805. I'm talking about the Battle I mean, of Tripoli, yes. Yeah, the Battle of Tripoli in 1805. And that's going to be... The United States first coming in contact with Islam. Right. Okay. And then it's going to be to 1989, 184 years. Correct. And we do, well, well how do we have Islam in 1989? Well, 1989 
would have been the 10th anniversary of the Soviet Union getting involved in Afghanistan. Right. So we know we have the war in Afghanistan. But on the other side, for that 10 year period, we have America supporting the Taliban with weapons and advice and money to fight the to fight the Soviet Union. Yeah. So America has been involved with Islam by that point, but now here we are 12 years later, September 11, 2001, and Islam has made the decision that the false prophet is the great Satan and they're going to attack them. Mm -hmm. Well, and they've been at attacking them. Actually, a lot of terrorism was going on in that period. Um, I know there was the attack on the, the the battleship or whatever it was. Um, with the bomb, the you know the smaller ship with the explosives. I don't remember when that was or anything. Right. And obviously, we had nineteen ninety three. I, mean, right. I just remember there was various attacks, some of these embassies and, and so forth. But the first attack on American soil is going to be February 26, 1993. Right. Now, the, the one point that, that Elder Jeff was making about these attacks, he was lining up. The ass turned out of the way, the double walls and the ass in the narrow path as being the false prophet striking the ass. When, you know, as we have been addressing this situation, in 1993, America did not strike back at Islam. 2001, definitely. Yeah. All the rest of this, <clears throat> we would be looking at it definitely. Now, what I also found interesting in this presentation, Elder Jeff correctly tied in with the narrow way. He tied in what we've been studying in Zechariah chapter 1. Mm -hmm. So there, there is quite a bit with this right now. There's going to be some refinement that's going to have to be done. There's going to be some shifting. I don't, I, I don't have the ability at the moment to say exactly how this is going to, is going to play out, mm -hmm. but we have a, a format that we would be able to use. Okay, now, so a couple of things. Now, we know, and I mentioned, of course, Jeff didn't know about the midnight way mark. He just right. has a cry here in 2015. But also, we hadn't really sorted out the line. So it's around this time, uh, because once we get the midnight cry way mark, uh, we're going to start mo moving the, the seven thunders. That is, Jeff is going to um, talk about these two uh that the two events 9 11 is going to mark both august 11th 1840 and april 19th 1844 because once we have the midnight cry we now start to line up uh 9 11 with the first day of the first month and then the midnight cry with the or, yeah, with the first day of the fifth month and then, of course, the Sunday Live with October 22nd, 1844. So we now have this midnight cry way mark, and we have a date for it in Millerite history and a symbol, first day of the fifth month, coming from Ezra 7-9, and, of course, the first day of the first month for 9-11. So we're going to end up combining those two together. 9-11 has this dual purpose. But the problem with that is how... 
uh, we didn't recognize these these various lines and how they're structured. So my case or my argument that I'm making is that 9-11 serves the purpose of August 11th, 1840 in one line and in another line it serves the purpose of April 19th, 1844. And since Jeff isn't making that distinction, he's going to have problems trying to fit this together. So until, and then we also have the problem of well, what line are we talking about? Because we've had the midnight cry already show up in our lines. Because October 13th, 2018 is the midnight cry. But not for the big line, of course. Not for the line of the Levites. And then we also say July 18th, 2020 is the midnight cry. And I think both have to be correct. It's just depending which line you're looking into. I mean, because that's what we're studying here is understanding lines. So, you know, coming to what Jeff was doing here, he's not, he's not wrong. He just doesn't have enough information that, to, to sort these out clearly. But when you ask the question about February 26th, um, 1993, if we understand what we have about this movement, what we're symbolizing, uh, we should be able to to distinguish these different waymarks and which lines they belong to. And so, you know, obviously we're not to the midnight cry that Jeff is talking about here. Right? We can't make the midnight cry here be July 18th because when we talk about the midnight cry in the line of the Levites, that's still something future because we're not even at midnight yet in the line of the Levites. So we can't be at the midnight cry. So we, we still have to distinguish which lines we're in, and we haven't sorted them out completely. But if we're going to say that, you know, uh, if we're going to take what Jeff has here, we would have to know which line we're on. And I, I think he's mixing up two different lines at least. I'm asking if he's not mixing up at least three. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Maybe even three. But that's the thing, you know, like we now know from our studies that the Sunday law way mark in it, that all of our history, that is the history when we're talking about the Levites and, and everything that's going to happen with the Sunday law, that that's the, that's the repeat of the parable of the, the 10 virgins. And that's going to represent our history, that it's being going to be fulfilled again to the very letter. But that's, that's a zoom into uh, our history is all that precedes that Sunday law. It's a repeat of the first and second angel's messages. But it's not on Ellen White's line. That is 9-11, midnight and the midnight cry, and 1989 don't exist on the line Ellen White's talking about. Because, you know, she's going to look at that just specifically as the Sunday law, July 18, or not July 18, Revelation 18 where we have Revelation 18 coming down at 9-11. So we know at least from 9-11 to the Sunday law is just a zoom into the Sunday law. But within each of these waymarks in our line, we can zoom in and find a line. And so I'm making a case that 9-11 represents this movement, that, that there is actually two different waymarks of 9-11. And... And we have to distinguish which way mark of 9-11 we're talking about because when we zoom into that, we're going to have a reform line when we zoom into 9-11. And so when we zoom in there, we're going to have this reform line that's going to have a time of the end. It's going to have um, midnight and, and it's going to have midnight and, but it's also going to have 
the time of the end, it's going to have a formalization of the message. It's going to have an empowerment of that first message. And then it's going to have midnight, midnight cry, and then a symbol of the Sunday law. And I think that we've, we've fulfilled that already. And that, that's primarily what the movement has done so far, is that we've experienced that zooming into 9-11 And that was Jeff zooming into 9-11. But that 9-11 would be the 9-11 that aligns with August 11th, 1840. Not the 9-11 that aligns with April 19th, 1844. But these two lines overlap. That is, what happened with Jeff's zooming into August 11th, 1840, which is a zoom into 9-11, so that symbol of it, um, had to do, in a sense, with the first angel's message. Even though it's going to have all of the way marks of a, whole, of a whole line, it's going to be about the first angel's message because August 11th, 1840, is an empowerment of the first angel's message. But this movement has moved into a zoom in to 9-11, that's part of April 14th, or April 19th, 1844, right? So Jeff, Jeff has finished his line. Now we're in this other line. And that line still precedes midnight because it's still just a zoom in to 9-11. Am, am I helping people see this better or people confused? Any comments on this? I think there's quite a bit we're going to have to look at. Yeah. To, to really refine where we're going to place this and on which line it's going to have to be placed. Yeah, because I have this document which which I believe is, oh, I'm not sure who wrote it. It could be Blessings. Uh, I'm not sure. It doesn't have a name attached to it. Um, and it's from 2017. And they're going to be addressing Balaam and uh, the crushing of the foot. And, and in there, they're going to say that this is, they're going to place it as Trump um, enforcing the Sunday law. I think that's what they do with it. I'd, I'd have to look at it again. But, but the point is, they have Trump listed there as fulfilling the prediction. But, but that was confusing the lines. That is, we didn't understand what we were talking about. So, so when we look at Trump right now, we know that Trump has fulfilled his role in one line, right? That is the line that Jeff is a part of. That's a zoom in to August 11th, 1840. And... The pandemic is the Sunday law. Right? Okay. So, so we have that. But we know now that, that we're in some other line as well. well. I mean, we're in lots of lines. But the, the next line that we're looking at, as we're looking for a waymark, is what's happened after July 18th. That is... We would, we would need to understand where this line begins, and I believe it begins on November 9th, um, 19, uh, 19, uh, not 19, 2019, right? So it begins on November 9th because that's going to be the first day of the first month, right? So that's going to be zooming into the April 19th, 9-11. And, and so we would have to understand how that works and the role that July 18th plays as the midnight cry and it's going to be connected to the sunday law right because it's going to happen at the time of this pandemic and then we we have to look because well stephen is not here right now but you know in his study he sees that there is there is something to these mandates the study of odilia with the mandates which is correct but the thing is, we're trying to interpret them 
without understanding what line we're in. And the only way that we can sort out these, these symbols is to know which line we're in. And, and that's, that's, that's really the task before us right now when it comes to what we're doing, why, why we're doing this study on understanding the lines and going through the Bible in this way. Because we keep running into these problems the first problem is what we understood in the past was incomplete. We know that because we can see it. No midnight. Well, you need to have midnight there. So, so then how do we, how do we sort through this line? And so I think that you can take February 26, 1993 and have it as, as the, the ass turning out of the way. But you need to know which line you're in. And I, I think that would still be Jeff's line or the one that he's a part of, whether it's FFA's line, whatever you want to call it. But that is looking at 9-11 as being August 11th, 1840. Because then that lines up. We start to see that all line up. But then when the ass speaks, well, that definitely isn't the Sunday law itself, right, that we're looking at on this line. But it is in connection with the pandemic. So how about this, Dwight? So take a look at this line. So if, if – so – can we have this ass also have something to do with, with the Democrats? Can the Democrats have any part in this? Yes, they certainly do. They were in power when the scandemic went forward with all its restrictions. And it right. And so we can see that the ass speaks at the Sunday law. Right. Right. We can also see these double walls. And what would these double walls be then? Is it possible that the double walls could be Congress and the Supreme Court? Okay, because you're using the laws to the walls to represent laws. Yes. Okay. Well, the way I, the way I understood it was the laws represent marriage and Sabbath. Right. So as, that's the way Jeff called it anyway. As, as we look at that, brother, marriage and family have been under attack substantially by the social. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, Right now, they don't wish to accept a family of one man, one woman, and children. And they wish to redefine marriage. That's part of the reason that I was asking the question, where was Balaam when he's riding between these, law, the, these two walls? Because I don't see the vineyards that he is riding through as being the Lord's vineyard. I'm asking if they're no, not. No, because Alan, sure, excuse me, White, Ellen White said that Balaam chased after Balak's end boys. So he could have come as far as their territory. In this situation, if he is yet in Babylon, then is this not the doctrines of Babylon that he is writing between and the laws of Babylon represented by the walls? Okay, so we're gonna have these double walls. When would these, this begin? Well, the double walls are going to have to begin 
prior to the Sunday law. So as we have seen this since September 11, 2001, we have had the socialists objecting greatly to the possibility of Roe v. Wade being overturned. This is part of their attack on family. Mm -hmm. But this is also part of the situation of a, a civil war because right now in America, it, the country is divided. The country is, has never been more divided now since it was in the 1850s over slavery. The socialists right now, the Sadducees, if we place it that way, are very focused that the definition of rights and family are to be redefined. Okay, so so if we're going to have these these double walls, and we're going to have this way mark as the midnight cry, where would we place that? I thought we were placing it, but. There again, I'm not I'm not 100% on my game today. Yeah. Well, okay. So so again, we know that there's this 9/11 way mark, and that our movement has has we have a way mark that we're zooming into. So 9/11 serves the purpose of the time of the end. If we're going to use it. If we're going to zoom into that way mark, would it not? Right. It would have to. Right. So so 9-11 is the time of the end. Now, we would say then the ass is turned out of the way at the time of the end. Would we say that? Or would we place it some other place? No, we would have to place it there. Okay. So then Midnight Cry, if we're going to use, if we're going to use this line, um, we would have to have midnight cry and we would have to have midnight. Right. But midnight isn't going to be one of these three events because midnight and midnight cry is a doubling. Right. It, it's really one way mark. If we remember where we started, it's one way mark. It, it has two aspects to it. But let's also, let's also consider that when Balaam's foot was crushed, Mm -hmm. I mean, when you when you have something like that happen, you're not silent about it. So would he have cried out when his foot was crushed? Yeah, the verses that come to me are about uh, let you know let the uh, foot. So the feet that are turning out of the way, it, it would be it's preferable that they be healed. And also the verse about how beautiful upon the mountaintops are the feet of those that preach the gospel of peace. Well, obviously he had turned out of the way. Obviously his loyalty was with the devil's men and no longer with Christ. So that's a vast apostasy right there. Too. Well, okay, let's also... Let's also, as we look at this, we have the example that Elder Jeff was presenting that Mary inquired, Elizabeth and Mary prophesied loudly. Now, had either John or Christ been born at that time? No. 
we know that Elizabeth had been in hiding for five months. Right? Yeah. So this would have occurred when they are prophesying prior to the birth of John and prior to the birth of Christ. Mm -hmm. So if we then inserted midnight and the midnight cry, would we not be able to place the crushing of the foot, the economic damage to the false problem as occurring between these two waymarks, midnight and the midnight crime? Okay, so one of the things is we know this is a typical line. Okay. That is, you know, we're, we talk about the Sunday law here, we talk about midnight and the midnight cry, but this is something within this movement. That is, it's illustrating something internal within the movement, but it's witnessed to by external events. Agreed. Right. That That is... We were, we were looking for certain type of external events. But those external events didn't happen, but they were predicted. And even just their prediction gives us a illustration or um, a symbol of, of what that waymark is. So we made a prediction, for instance, November 9th, 2019, nothing happened that was predicted except the close of probation for the false priests. And July 18, 2020, we made a prediction. Nothing happened except a disappointment that parallels October 22nd, 1844, but also parallels July 18th, 1844, because July 18th, 1844 is typical of October 22nd, 1844, because October 22nd is the 187th day of the Jewish year. Its symbol there is July 18th. So Samuel Snow's last letter being published on July 18 is typifying October 22nd, 1844. And so we know that in our history, our disappointment parallels July 18th, 1844, but also connects with the disappointment October 22, 1844. And that's because this movement has to repeat the first and second angel's messages. It has to experience it. And so it has. So... When we're going to look at this ass in the double walls and the ass that's dumb, it just turns out of the way to the field, and the ass that speaks, we're not looking at these in the context of the big line. But that's still future. The Sunday law is still future. But we have had an experience that we have shown that is a type of the Sunday law, that is the pandemic. So if we're going to take the ass here, as representing uh, the Democrats when the ass speaks. That is, that's going to be the mandates, right? Because that would be Odilio's study. Then the ass walking between the double walls, this would have to do with the Democrats. Right. Okay. Now we say that, you know, um, Balaam represents the United States, but can we say that what the Democrats have done has wounded the foot of the United States? I think that's possible. Yeah. So when you're talking about these two uh, two aspects, the family, right? And the other aspect is marriage well we said marriage and family yeah marriage and family so that's one and the other one they wounded the sabbath too in pushing the green sunday the climate change rubbish yeah well it really hasn't pushed that i mean they talked about it we don't have it enforced but they're enforcing it in a way now like they're they're obviously promoting it by making fuel prices for example so high that people have to get off the roads in some cases. It's happened to me. A friend of mine was going to come here. There's no way I'm not paying those gas prices. It's happening to a lot of people. 
Uh, but it doesn't affect it's, one specific day of the week and it's not by decree or anything. But it's all, it funnels into this. This is part of this Green Sunday movement. Yeah. Well, yes, but when we're looking at this, because we're talking about this internally, so we have internal events in this movement witnessed to by external events. And so if we're going to look at these double walls, one would have to be the family, marriage, right? Right. And would we say the other one is um, the Sabbath that's going to be those those two aspects of the law. Well, I think that, that Elder Jeff made those made those points. So I think that that could work. Yeah. Okay. So this is going to happen in our history. Um, specifically, when? Well, the one wall we know has already has already been touched and that's the family the marriage okay but where are we where are we placing that 2000 is it the gay marriage thing or was that 2015 15 or 18 it wasn't 18 okay. it was before then but maybe maybe uh okay so so we have these three um these three events and and we have the ass turning out of the way so the question is where are we going to place them if we have the sunday laws being the pandemic and when the ass is turned out of the way remember that that's going to bring balaam out of the way balaam is the united states Right. So we have we have different manners in which to apply this because we're looking at this as being part of additional lines. Lines which are zoomed into waymarks. So we zoom into a waymark, we find a new line. Right. And that line has to do with this, this movement, even though it's witnessed to by events in the world. Because the Sunday law is the pandemic, right? The pandemic is universal, right? Just like the Sunday law is universal. It's got pan in it. But we know that it's not the Sunday law. It's not the Sunday law on the big line. It typifies it only. Right. Because it's not even about Sunday. Right. I mean, okay. we try to attach some things to it. You know, they close some stores or whatever. But really, it's not about Sunday. It's about the state having power over us. Correct. Yeah. And, and taking away constitutional rights because of a pandemic. Well, the Sunday law is going to be similar in that sense because constitutional rights will be taken away. It's not going to be a pandemic that's causing the Sunday law. Right? That's not the test that we've been given. Now, we're in the spirit of prophecy. Do we have such a test as vaccine or anything like that? But we do have the test of the Sunday law. But it typifies it definitely because it goes against freedom of conscience for people to choose. So if we're looking at this one dealing with this, the, the pandemic being the Sunday law, um, in this line itself, we wouldn't be going back to, you know, 1993 unless we want to have, you know, that be the time of the end. And we look, we could, so we could have that be the time of the end, or we could have that be a formalization of a message or, or you know, because in the first way, Mark, in that from the time of the end when it arrives, there are two way marks there. Right. But here we have, you know, three different events. And and we could all say, you know, one is the first angel's message, one is the second. We could even say, you know, but 
but we can see here that this doesn't fit in you know if you have 911 911 representing the first day of the first month that doesn't fit in right that is we don't have a line starting at 911 if we're dealing with um because 911 is the second angel's message if if we're using it as the second angel's message but if we're using it as the empower of the first angel's message then we have a, a different line that we're looking at so that's what we would have to decide and I, I don't i don't personally think we have enough information yet to sort through these lines that we're in well as the millerite did as the millerites had mm -hmm. they had met they had studied they had prayed mm -hmm. now our situation is we know what what elder jeff has presented part of this if you go back through that that study on the 31st of january 2015 mm -hmm. you'll see the same type of chart i mean i i did the best i could as quickly as i could to put this together mm -hmm. But there's a lot of data that I was not able to put on here. Yeah. Now, we're talking that from 2015 to 2020, that there's quite a bit of refinement that has gone on. And I think, you know, in, in the, the rest of the picture, that from 2020 to 2022 to the present day, we've refined a lot of this even further than that. Mm -hmm. now and we see a millerite history i mean because we studied that all we saw that you know they were looking at a for a close of boat close of probation on august 11th 1840 or, or very soon after that you know they saw that as the beginning of the seventh trumpet well you know that that shifted as time went on lots of things that they were predicting to happen before the second coming didn't occur so they just set them aside and so we know our movement has done the same thing. But one thing we see is that the Lord was leading the Millerite movement in their unfolding of light. And that they weren't, you couldn't go back and say, well, they were essentially wrong. Because as they proceed, they now just start to sort out where they are in that stream of time. And after the disappointment, the first disappointment, they have more light that comes. After the great disappointment, they have more light that comes. And so this movement is no different than the Millerite movement in that respect. So, so I don't know if I would take what Jeff is doing here with 9-11 being, you know, the ass turning out of the way and the midnight cry is going to be these double walls. And then the Sunday law is going to be this narrow place and the dumbass speaks as representing something that where like i don't even well that wouldn't even really fit on the big line right it wouldn't fit on on the big line at all but it definitely doesn't apply to our line that, that what we're experiencing so we would have to to sort through this now now the reason we're doing this is we're studying uh judges chapter 11 right Are we on chapter? Yeah, we're on chapter 11. And why are we studying Balaam again? Just to remind us. Anybody remember why we went to Balaam? I mean, Dwight had to step away for a second. Anybody remember what the key verse was that led us to the study of Balaam? Dwight, do you remember what, what verse we were looking at that led us to the study of Balaam? Yeah, we were, we were in Judges 10. Oh, it's Ch Judges 10? Okay, that's why. 
and mm -hmm. it's going to be I'm sure it's Judges ten. Maybe it was Judges eleven. It's the Judges eleven. Okay, um, because I brought up I brought up the question dealing with Balaam on this point. Okay, just a moment. Okay. I mean, one is we know about the children of the East. So that was one thing. But there was something else. And I, I don't remember specifically what it was that caused us to just jump to the study of Balaam. Because we had a question that we were trying to answer. And, and I forget now what it was. Okay. Just a moment. <clears throat> So we were dealing what we were dealing with. Mm -hmm. We had the land of Moab. We had the children of Ammon. Right. Both being referenced. And I think that was we'd gotten into this in regard to the messengers that were sent unto the king of the children of Ammon. Right. Because, That's in uh, chapter 11. Correct. Yeah. 11, so, 14, and 15. Yeah. And, and even further on. But yeah. So, so he sends messengers unto the king of Ammon. And he said unto him, Thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt, they walked through the wilderness unto the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. And, and so it's going to go through this history of of their their travel from Egypt um, to the promised and, land. And then when we come down to it in 1125 we have Balak being referenced again as well. Right. So then we got Balak the son of Zippor king are thou anything better than Balak the son of Zippor king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel or did he ever fight against them? So so that's, I think, where we went. So, and, and we just didn't understand the story of Balaam. And I still don't think we fully understand it. I mean, I'm going to have to spend quite a bit more time studying this, trying to, to go through, because uh, this early study on it, I mean, I actually remember it, you know, once I saw the board, I remember, oh, I, I seen that video. But I remember at the time, I didn't understand what Jeff was talking about. So I, I wasn't, it, you know, I, I couldn't make heads nor tails out of, out of that part of the message. There's quite a bit about this, given the refinements that have occurred since 2015, where we need to be considering this example in the light of what we've already passed through. Mm -hmm. And that's why the, the question I asked at the outside of today's meeting was where we would place July 18th, if July 18th was indeed the midnight cry or was the symbol of the midnight cry. So there's a lot yet for us to consider so that we can go back into this in Judges and look directly at the symbolism that's presented within. Okay. Now, when we go back there, so I had, well, I'll call it a revelation, that of, of Jephthah's tragic vow, what it means. Right. Because that was the thing that really, really bothered me. But part of it is once I understood it, I could then place it and and I'm going to place it with July 18th okay um, because I was I before trying to look at this as something as future for this movement um, I think you're right yeah and so so we're gonna look at that when we we come back to this uh, tomorrow or whenever we we get to this but just to sort of give an idea here, is what this vow is, is he, he asks that 
you know, if God vow, you know, he vows a vow to the Lord, if thou shalt, um, if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of, forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Now, it's going to be his daughter. So he makes this vow, but he has no comprehension of what price he's going to have to pay. Right? And if you look at this movement, this movement has made a prediction. Were we aware of the price that we had to pay when we made Not that? At all. Okay. So, so what God is requiring of us, we just don't have a clue. This is something that is so beyond us, and yet we we believe that we're ready for whatever's coming, that we, we're in the know, we're safe somehow because we have a certain understanding. But what God is asking is a sacrifice. Now, in studying this, Ellen White doesn't give us any information on this. Um, and I've, I've hemmed and hawed a little bit over whether he actually kills his daughter or not. No. And, yeah, so, and, and I've looked at, you know, the arguments for one, you know, one is it's just she's bewailing her virginity. Um, but I don't think it actually matters in the context of what it means to us from the point of the sacrifice that we have to make. This, this is a great sacrifice to be in this message. It's not something that's just a, a, a interest. It's something that we have to now face the cross of Christ. I mean, this is, we as Adventists, we talk about the time of Jacob's trouble. We talk about what's coming upon the world. And we just don't have a clue. And part of it is because we haven't experienced the first and second angels' messages. Right? So this goes back to the study on the three angels' messages. But we don't know what sacrifice is. We live in, in a world of indulgence. Now, some of us have had very difficult times, um, you know, poverty and all these types of things but we still don't know what sacrifice is and and so that's where i'm where i'm thinking that this story is going but then when we take this story then to place it in its context it falls better into place once we realize that this rash vow or tragic vow of jephthah is the prediction of of july 18 2020 right then, then the other things fall into place much better. But that means it's also symbolizing something that, that is future on a bigger line, because our line is typical, right? But that's the way it's going to have to be. Yeah. So, you know, how much we have to sort out. I don't, I don't think we have to, to sort out everything about Numbers 22, though I think we should look at it again uh, tomorrow. Does that make sense? Of course. Yeah, and then see how far we get, because we might see more in this again. But then we come back to, to Judges chapter 11 and, and go through that. And that can help a bit more. But then we can understand the reference uh, to Balak better and, and why it's placed here. You know, in the context of how we've understood um, Numbers 22, or how we should understand it at least. Right. Okay, well, 
I think with, with what you were just saying, we're going to have to look at this. We'll come back to Numbers 22 tomorrow. We'll get hopefully through this and then be into uh, Judges 11 Sunday morning. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now are there any other comments or questions with what we've been addressing? Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the conversation and the contributions throughout this study. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon this day. Direct us now, as we have studied, that we may have the ability to consider these items. Direct us in the path where we should walk. Help us today so that that which we do may bring glory to your character and to your name. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.